Welcome. In this session, we are going to discuss the other two non-infectious panuviitis, sympathetic ophthalmia and Vogt-Koyanagi-Harda syndrome, also known as VKH syndrome. Sympathetic ophthalmia and Vogt-Koyanagi-Harda syndrome can actually be very similar in presentation apart from the history. Sympathetic ophthalmia and Vogt-Koyanagi-Harda syndrome are both bilateral diffuse granulomatous panuviitis. The epithelioid and the giant cells of the granulomatous uveitis can contain pigment granules. They have similar clinical features including similar HLA associations. By definition, sympathetic ophthalmia occurs after ocular injury and VKH does not have a history of ocular injury. We will start with sympathetic ophthalmia and sympathetic ophthalmia occurs after an ocular injury. Penetrating ocular trauma has been a known cause of sympathetic ophthalmia for a very long time now and it was the most important cause previously. However, the incidence has decreased with proper microsurgical closure of the penetrating wound. However, sympathetic ophthalmia following intraocular surgery, particularly transconjunctival sutureless vitreoretinal surgery, is increasing in incidence and is now considered the main risk and it is said that sympathetic ophthalmia occurs due to an autoimmune reaction to uveoretinal antigens which are exposed to conjunctival lymphatics following an ocular trauma or following a sutureless vitreoretinal surgery. And tyrosinase related peptides of melanocytes are an important antigen against which the autoimmune reaction occurs. Previously, it used to occur in males, children and elderly patients when penetrating ocular trauma was the major cause. However, currently with sympathetic ophthalmia occurring after intraocular surgery, there is no sex predilection and sympathetic ophthalmia now occurs in all age groups. The course of the disease includes a penetrating wound to one eye and that is called the exciting eye followed by a latent period. This latent period can be of several weeks to several years in duration. Sympathetic ophthalmia has been described as early as 5 days after injury and as late as 66 years after injury. However, 80% of sympathetic ophthalmia has an onset within 3 months of injury. And following this latent period, there is inflammation in both the exciting eye that is the injured eye and the other contralateral eye which is said to be the sympathizing eye. So typically sympathetic ophthalmia presents as an asymmetrical bilateral granulomatous panuveitis and initially the intraocular inflammation is usually more in the exciting eye or the injured eye. It involves the choroid but spares the choriocapillaries in the early stages of the disease. So here we find mutton fat keratic precipitates indicating a granulomatous intraocular inflammation. Posterior segment involvement in sympathetic ophthalmia usually occurs in the early stage of the disease and there is usually a moderate to severe vitritis. Exudative retinal detachment and dallin fuchs nodules are the characteristic features in the posterior segment in sympathetic ophthalmia. Here in this picture we find multifocal exudative retinal detachments. dallin fuchs nodules occurs later in the sympathetic ophthalmia and is a characteristic of sympathetic ophthalmia and it appears as yellowish white mid peripheral choroidal nodules elevating the retinal pigment epithelium and dallin fuchs nodules histopathologically are epithelioid cell accumulation between retinal pigment epithelium and the brax membrane and apart from sympathetic ophthalmia in which dallin fuchs nodules are characteristic dallin fuchs nodules are also found in vkh we will be discussing subsequently and sarcoidosis which we have discussed in the previous session optic nerve edema can also be found anterior segment involvement usually occurs in the later stages of sympathetic ophthalmia and usually presents with mutton fat keratic precipitates and posterior synechia in sympathetic ophthalmia although posterior segment involvement tends to occur earlier in the disease and anterior segment involvement tends to occur later in the disease involvement of anterior and posterior segments may be variable in onset and severity systemic features of sympathetic ophthalmia are similar to vkh syndrome but are much less common and include csf pleocytosis sensory neural hearing loss alopecia polyosis and vitiligo 
in fluorescent angiography in the early stage of the disease we find early phase multiple hyperfluorescent leakage points and in the late phases of the angiogram we find accumulation of dye within the exudative retinal detachment we'll see a picture depicting this when we'll discuss vkh which has a similar appearance the choroidal lesions in the later stages show early phase hypofluorescence with late phase hyperfluorescent staining on icg we find multiple areas of hypocyanescence particularly in the mid phase in the later stages of the disease oct may show retinal detachment photoreceptor elongation loss of isos junction dalin fuchs nodules and macular thickening and cme and on usg we will find diffuse choroidal thickening treatment includes systemic steroids in the acute stage of the disease and later on and if there is anterior uveitis topical steroids and cycloplegics will also need to be instituted early institution and long term continuation of immunomodulatory therapy is also required and visual prognosis of sympathetic ophthalmia is guarded complications of sympathetic ophthalmia include cataract macular edema choroidal neovascularization subretinal fibrosis and optic atrophy now how can we prevent sympathetic ophthalmia from happening following a penetrating trauma so following a penetrating trauma every attempt should be made to close the wound properly with meticulous clearing of uveal tissues from the subconjunctival space so this is very important only if the ocular injury is irreparable or there is no possibility of visual potential of the eye the globe should be removed within 2 weeks of injury and during removal enucleation is preferred over evisceration because enucleation ensures removal of all the uveal tissue however there is no benefit of removal of the injured eye after 2 weeks of injury or removal of the injured eye after onset of inflammation in either the exciting eye or the sympathizing eye and after resolution of inflammation the exciting eye may actually be the better seeing eye the next entity we are going to discuss is the vogt kuyanagi harada syndrome or vk syndrome vk is a bilateral diffuse granulomatous pan uveitis associated with involvement of the integumentary system or the skin the nervous system and the auditory system it is a t cell mediated autoimmune response to antigens in melanocytes usually the tyrosine related peptides the same group of antigens as in sympathetic ophthalmia which are present throughout the body it is more common in pigmented races and the onset is usually between second to fifth decades characteristically there are four sequential stages so this is very important in understanding vkh we have a prodromal stage the acute uveitic stage the convalescent stage and the chronic recurrent stage the occurrence of symptoms in these four sequential stages actually helps us to diagnose the disease the prodromal stage starts few days before the onset of the uveitis and consists of fever headache meningitis nausea with tinnitus and dysacusia involving the higher frequencies auditory symptoms typically persist for 2 months but persistent functional deficits can remain so the two chief symptoms of prodromal stage in vkh are meningitis and tinnitus patients in the prodromal stage may also complain of orbital pain and photophobia hypersensitivity of skin to touch especially of the scalp hairs and rarely there can be focal neurological signs in the prodromal stage including cranial neuropathies transverse myelitis hemiparesis and aphasia CSF analysis shows lymphocytic pleocytosis with normal glucose levels so lymphocytic pleocytosis in the CSF is also an important feature of the disease and it also persists for 2 to 3 months in the second stage or the acute uveitic stage retinal detachment is the most important sign and it usually starts 2 to 3 days after onset of the prodromal stage the patient complains of bilateral sequential blurring of vision there is mild to moderate vitritis and we find multiple serous detachments in the posterior pole initially they are shallow focal and well demarcated and there can be radiating folds resulting in a clover leaf pattern then these initially shallow focal and well demarcated exudative retinal detachments may coalesce to form a bullous retinal detachment there can also be optic nerve edema 
posterior choroidal thickening, shallowing of the anterior chamber from an annular choroidal detachment or ciliary body edema and less commonly there can be a granulomatous anterior uveitis but this is typically a feature of the chronic recurrent stage. In the third or the convalescent stage there is depigmentation of the eye and the skin and it starts several weeks after the acute uveitic stage of exudative retinal detachment. In the convalescent stage the exudative retinal detachment disappears and there is gradual depigmentation of the eye and the skin as a result of which we get an orange red discoloration of the fundus called the sunset glow fundus and there are small round discrete punched out lesions in the periphery commonly inferiorly from loss of RPE and chorioretinal scarring resembling Dallin-Fuchs nodules. There can also be pigmentary clumping of RPE. Limbal vitiligo surrounding the cornea can also be found in this stage and it is called sugiurus sign and in the skin we will find alopecia poliosis of the eyelashes and vitiligo on face, hands, shoulders and back. The chronic recurrent stage is characterized by anterior uveitis granulomatous in nature and we find mutton fat keratic precipitates, iris nodules, posterior synechia, iris stromal atrophy and iris depigmentation can also occur. Recurrent posterior segment involvement is less common but can occur in the chronic recurrent stage and complications which occur in the chronic recurrent stage include cataract, glaucoma, choroidal neovascularization and subretinal fibrosis. In the acute stage, fluorescent angiography shows multiple punctate hyperfluorescent leakage points in the early phase. So here we find hyperfluorescent leakage points in the early phase followed by pooling of the dye within the neurosensory detachments in the late phase. There can be disc leakage but macular edema and vessel leakage is uncommon. So these three pictures are taken on the same day. This is the color photograph, the early phase in the angiogram and the late phase in the angiogram and one week after institution of treatment the color photograph shows resolution of the exudative retinal detachment. In the chronic stage, we can find transmission hyperfluorescence without staining in areas of the RPE loss. The indocyanin green angiography in the acute stage shows a delay in choroidal perfusion, early phase choroidal hypercyanescence with a leakage from the choroidal vessels marked by the arrows, and punctate hypercyanescent foci can also be seen in areas of exudative retinal detachment. In the chronic stage, we find hypocyanescent spots in areas of chorioretinal atrophy. In fundus autofluorescence, we find granular appearance of both hyperautofluorescence and hypoautofluorescence in chronic stages from RPE damage. In ultrasonogram, we find a diffuse low to medium choroidal thickening in the posterior choroid, particularly in the peripapillary area. An associated exudative retinal detachment can also be found on the USG. Vitreous opacification and posterior thickening of the sclera can also be detected, but the T sign of posterior scleritis is not found. On OCT, we find serous retinal detachment, retinal thickening, and characteristic fibrin bands connecting RPE with retina. So, these are characteristic of Vogt Koyanagi Harada syndrome. So, we find these connecting bands from the retina to the RPE. EDI OCT shows choroidal thickening and as we have discussed in the acute stage CSF shows lymphocytic pleocytosis. Histopathology of the acute uveitic phase shows granulomatous inflammation of chiefly the peripapillary choroid with sparing of the choriocapillaries and inflammation may also be found in the iris and the ciliary body and protein rich subretinal fluid is found which is responsible for the exudative retinal detachment. In the convalescent stage, the infiltration of the choroid is non-granulomatous, there is decrease in the number of melanocytes resulting in sunset glow fundus and vitiligo and in the mid-periphery we find namular RP atrophic patches with chorioretinal adhesion. In the chronic recurrent stage, we find granulomatous inflammation of the choroid with involvement of the choriocapillaries. The revised diagnostic criteria for VKH syndrome describes a presentation of VKH as complete VKH syndrome, incomplete VKH syndrome and a probable VKH syndrome. In complete VKH syndrome, all the five criteria must be present. 
the first being no history of penetrating ocular trauma or surgery, no clinical or laboratory evidence of any other ocular and systemic disease, bilateral ocular disease with sensory retinal detachments in the early stage and in the late stage there should be more than one of ocular depigmentation, namular chorioretinal depigmented scars, RP pigment clumping and migration and recurrent or chronic anterior uveitis. The fourth criteria is neurologic or auditory signs which may be absent at the time of examination because it usually occurs in the prodromal stage. And the signs considered in the revised diagnostic criteria are tinnitus, meningismus and CSF pleocytosis. Integumentary signs considered in the diagnostic criteria are alopecia, polyosis and vitiligo and they should not be preceding either the CNS disease or the ocular disease. They should be following the CNS or the ocular symptoms and signs. The revised diagnostic criteria considers a VKH presentation as incomplete if either 4 or 5 is present but not both. And the revised diagnostic criteria considers a VKH presentation as probable if neither neurologic and auditory signs nor the integumentary signs can be elicited. The target of treatment of VKH syndrome includes early control of the acute stage of the disease with an attempt to reduce the risk of progressing to the chronic recurrent stage. And the acute presentation is controlled with early administration of high dose intravenous or oral steroids with slow tapering. Topical steroids and cycloplegics may be instituted if there is anterior uveitis. Immunomodulatory therapy is also indicated in VKH syndrome to prevent or control chronic recurrent disease and also in acute disease either not responding to steroid or patient not being able to tolerate steroid therapy. Prognosis of VKH syndrome is guarded with 70% of patients retaining a vision of 20 by 40 or better with steroids and IMT. Thank you for listening.